Hi, and welcome to Boom It's on the Blockchain. My name's uh, Alistair Caithness. It's our 90th show, and we've got a special guest with us today, Fernando Rivero. How are you? Hey, everyone. I'm doing great. How about yourself? Good, good. So so where are you based just now? There looks like there's palm trees in the background there, Fernando. <laughs> I'm in the palm tree state. I'm in uh, Miami, Florida, actually, today. Oh, perfect, perfect. Weather looks pretty good, does it? Oh, yeah. Nice and sunny out here today. Nice and sunny. Okay, perfect. So today we're going to be speaking about the, the Bitcoin Energy Summit. So just to kick things off, Fernando, can you give a little bit of background about yourself before we go into the summit itself? Sure. So I've been in the blockchain industry for about seven, eight years. Uh, started off as a day trader and eventually transitioned to mining cryptocurrency. Uh, did that for a little over five years. Um, since then, you know, I've also been doing events. Uh, I've hosted large conferences around mining and blockchain industry. Uh, one of the things that I felt very passionate about was that at the time, 2016, 2017, blockchain had a very negative moniker. And uh, folks were uh, mining, but what I what I felt or what I noticed was that folks were really working in silos, individual silos, and not really connecting with one another. Um, there was a lot of scamming, as the industry has had in uh, earlier years, right? And uh, folks were very hesitant to purchase mining equipment online from Asia and things like that, right? Uh, so what I decided to do was to start a mining conference with a couple of my friends and, and that kind of blew up. And since then we've been doing uh, events around blockchain, mining, NFTs, and we've transitioned that or parlayed that into this new energy summit uh, because we do feel although mining is, is pivotal from a blockchain perspective, uh, for the proof of work consensus. It's also uh, something that we need to do with a sustainable mindset, I guess, you know, to say. Uh, we want to make sure that when we're mining cryptocurrency, we're doing it in a way where we're, we're taking care of the economy, we're taking care of our environment, right? So um, that's a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been in, uh, like I said, blockchain for quite a few years, and, and uh, I've been in the financial sector for about three times as long. So it's a little bit about myself. Yeah, yeah. So that's definitely early for a lot of people because I really started getting involved in blockchain space about 2018. And then even then, that doesn't seem that long to people. It's about six, seven years, maybe 2017, 18, when I started to really get involved and we started writing these white papers to do with uh, <clears throat> tokenizing energy assets. But if you start going back to like 2015, 16, and that really is the early doors, considering, you know, it was 2012 since Satoshi Nakamoto invented Bitcoin in the blockchain. Mm -hmm. So what do you see the differences between then and now in terms of um, adoption by the market space? Oh, great question. Um, I mean, ETFs is a very hot word right now um, when we're talking about uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, hopefully Ethereum ETF soon, right? Um, I, I think it's a lot more mainstream. Uh, the, the whole concept of ETFs has allowed folks to get engaged or invest in blockchain and cryptocurrencies without having to uh, deal with all the uh, onboarding, let's say, the KYC process, the, the uh, need to store private keys, where am I going to store the cryptocurrency, all the things that I really enjoyed learning about it is is just skipped right uh, from an investor perspective now with ETFs. One thing that I, I noticed recently is as the ETFs are pumping up, uh, gold's actually dropping, and and I think that's a large indicator on people's uh, on individuals' perspective on on cryptocurrency as a viable investment tool. Um, yeah, the other thing that's also very interesting from a financial perspective is the concept of um, I guess U.S. backed tokens, right? Uh, uh, USDT, things like that. Uh, I've also been reading a lot of articles around where individuals in perhaps Argentina and things like that are deferring from using typical um, currency and now using, you know, Tether and things like that. I think, I think right now folks are dipping their toes more so in the pond uh, around blockchain and cryptocurrency, around Bitcoin and Ethereum specifically. But I think once it becomes a little bit more stable and we're not seeing those large two to three percent shifts per day, 
I, I think it's really going to be uh, a pivotal mark point in the market. Um, as we're nearing that having the cryptocurrency having, I think in the next 70, 75 days, I also think that that's also going to be uh, very important from a price perspective for cryptocurrency between the ETFs buying billions and trillions of cryptocurrency and now the incoming supply being cut in half. I just think the whole concept of the supply and demand of, of Bitcoin is really going to pivot in a way that we've never seen before, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, especially if you've got a lot of Bitcoin there, Fernando, you know, from the early days. <laughs> for, for those that have held, hopefully they will be rewarded. <laughs> yeah, for the, the, the early hodlers. But for for all hodlers, it's a good thing, you know. And I think if you think of some people like Elizabeth Warren, who's sort of anti-Bitcoin, but she's mm -hmm. becoming a bit softer on it because she's obviously in BlackRock probably gives her a, a few dollars towards her campaign funds. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you think of them talking about like, Bitcoin, it's, it's always seen as this high risk asset. So, mm -hmm. and then it's the most stable asset of everything in the crypto industry. So anything else involved in the crypto industry, you know, as you're doing it with technology and then I think NFTs came along and then I don't know, what what's your thoughts on NFTs and how that affected the market space? Yeah. Well, NFTs allowed for a more volatile investment opportunity for those that were looking for it. Um, a lot of the early Bitcoin adopters were high risk investors that believed in the concept. And to your point, you know, Bitcoin is not as volatile as before. I mean, it's still volatile, but not as it doesn't have as large of a swing. Um, the NFTs allowed individuals to um, uh, to invest into more opportunities, invest into um businesses in some instances, everyone was essentially creating an NFT to be able to fund something that they were passionate about. Uh, me personally, I thought that utility NFTs had a lot of value. I personally invested in some, which are still uh, providing utility. One specific one that I've invested in here in Miami, which I'm still hodling and still using is the Captain's Club NFT, which provides access to uh, exclusive events, through Eleven, which is a, a local brand here, as well as their venues. So I, I do think that NFTs, although they are a strong um, way of being able to raise capital for individuals, somewhat like a form of tokenization to an extent, um, slightly easier. I, I, I feel like it's it's going to be less of a investment tool and more of a uh, uh, utility of some of the cryptocurrencies. So for example, I'll be able to, um, uh, I guess, tokenize or not tokenize, uh, NFTIs or place on an NFT, uh, my car, my home, um, things like that, where I can now, I guess, store that value or store that asset in a way that I wasn't able to before. Um, as a homeowner, right, I, I don't know where my home deed is, not sure if that's a good or bad thing, but if it was an NFT, I know it would be stored on my ledger, right? And I can easily access it and I can see all the history behind it. And I think that's that's going to add value um, from one way or another in the future. Yeah, and I think for the audience to understand as well, it's it, 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 it made it easy for people to hash things on chain. And but I think a lot of people saw, you know, Jake Paul's brother, Logan Paul, mm -hmm. famously, he was like the leading NFT guy buying all the board apes for like 600,000, a million dollars, stuff like that. And then suddenly people got into that board ape thing. But even in the art world, to be able to actually show ownership of it mm -hmm. there as well. And I, I think from, you know, an oil and gas perspective that we've been working on out here is... You know, if you find out the ownership of leases and the ownership into oil and gas, it's all held in small sort of rinky dink courthouses. If you have to update the ownership there, the documentation's there, it's all paper based. It's very long time to do it. If they converted all this information to be hashed onto a blockchain and then it's very easily accessible to people in the same way you're doing with your house, but you're dealing with multiple other things as well. So I think it's just an avenue to put more things on chain. And 
people seem to think it's because they see all the digits and see the technology, they think it's actually complex. But what's interesting about it now is it's very easy to hash anything on chain. So, and it's very easy for people to track that as well. It's just that sort of opens up what it is. I think from our perspective, when we were starting to like hash information of like barrels of oil on chain, and when we started to do the first stuff with Zion, you know, we thought, yeah, we're going to hash every barrel of oil that we're producing on chain. But the question is, like, do people actually want that information? And I felt that when it was first coming out, Fernando, it's like we wanted to put everything on chain. But now we're starting to realize that we don't need to put everything on chain. They can be held in databases because it doesn't actually matter. But there's so much information in terms of documentation, ownership, et cetera, that it's basically where on chains coming on to it as well. So, so before we go speak of the summit, let's speak a little bit about um, crypto mining and the sustainability aspect of it. So why do you think it got such a bad rep at the time? Well, um, I don't necessarily think, well, a little bit of a loaded question there, right? So um, I do feel that it was difficult to mine in the beginning not necessarily a bad rap, but it was very difficult to mine. You know, I, I had to find a vendor, hope that that vendor was, you know, legit, um, wasn't going to try and steal my, my funds, was actually going to send something. Um, if you're trying to deal with the large ASIC manufacturers, they've got a minimum order quantity that they've got. So, you know, you've got to find somebody who's willing to set, sell you a small amount of ASICs if you're trying to come up. And then once you do, then you're ordering things and you've got to... I'm in the state, so I've got to change my electrical outlet. I've got to change quite a few things. There, there, there was a lot of barriers of entry. Um, now, that's specific to ASIC mining. For the uh, individuals that were doing GPUs, I, I did that as well. Uh, that was more, for me, it was more of a hobby, um, being able to build out a bunch of computers and kind of set them all up. So I, I thought that was very fun. I, I do feel that, not to skip your question, but to slightly talk about something I'm a little bit passionate about, I do feel that it, it's in, I, I'm very interested to see what happens with Bitcoin mining now with the ETFs. You know, there's, there's a lot of discussions about, you know, what's going to happen when the last Bitcoin gets mined. Well, the, the idea there is, you know, the miners are going to be rewarded through, through, you know, um, trades, right? There's going to be so many uh, trades on the blockchain that they're going to be rewarded through through the fees, um, which are low, right? But if you've got billions and billions of transactions, you know, those fees add up, those those pennies make a chain, make a difference. But if we've got, if we've got ETFs that are buying up billions of dollars of cryptocurrency to hold it for other individuals, and we're talking about putting that cryptocurrency in a location and not trading it, and if you look at Bitcoin itself, most people hodl and they've been hodling for quite a few years. They're not really trading it. So if the amount of transactions are not increasing at the rate we want it to, what's going to happen from a mining perspective when um, when uh, the last cryptocurrency gets mined, right? Are we going to have as uh, the amount of transactions needed to support miners keeping their infrastructure alive? And, and that's something that I think it's, I don't know, concerns me a little bit, right? Um, what's going to happen to the future of mining once, once that last cryptocurrency gets, gets mined? And, and that's why you look at Ethereum and Ethereum transition from proof of work to proof of stake. And, you know, you're earning some interest there if you're holding it, right? Um, so, so, yeah, that's my, my opinion on that specifically. Yeah, and I think... To explain to people as well why the Bitcoin halving that's coming up is going to be so significant to everyone, not only the miners, but to everyone else out there and how this can actually have, be a, a big effect in time in the price as well. Oh, yeah. So the, the Bitcoin halving, you know, historically is is the time in which Bitcoin and cryptocurrency tends to go parabolic. Um, meaning price going up, up, up. Um, it's essentially a point in time when uh, cryptocurrency rewards to miners gets cut in half, right? So um, Satoshi Nakamoto created the the uh, Bitcoin um, algorithm in a way where once there was a certain supply in 
circulation, then the amount that continues to be added continuously gets reduced, right? So over time, supply is going to decrease or new supply is going to decrease, hopefully pushing that price up. And it's, I feel like it's doing exactly what he's envisioned it was going to do. I thought it was very a very unique way of controlling the supply and demand without controlling it per se. So that's a little bit about the Bitcoin having and what's coming. So I think if you couple what happened over the last month with ETFs being approved and trillions, billions of dollars coming into the blockchain industry, and then now you're cutting that supply that's going to be added into the sector in half, then you know supply and demand is just going to continue to push that price up. Uh, I do envision it getting over that 100K market at a certain point, hopefully this year. Um, and I'm excited to see exactly where it lands. Yeah, and I, I think for people to understand that, you know, once the Bitcoin halving happens, essentially the cost for the miners is going to double. Correct. For the electricity. Is that correct? Well, it's going to cost twice as much electricity to earn the same reward, essentially what's going to happen. So if right now they're spending a thousand dollars to earn one Bitcoin, they're going to be spending a thousand dollars to earn half of a Bitcoin. That's essentially, you know, high level of how it's going to work. Um, a lot of those from a mining perspective, getting a little bit into the details, you know, the, the cost is really purchasing the land, paying for the electricity, working out some sort of agreement with the ele electrical company, if you can do so. Um, and what we like to try and push from a, a energy summit perspective is that these companies that are, are building these large farms or data centers use a, a type of energy that is healthy for the environment as a whole, right? So we've got a lot of potential energy uh, that is not really being used. You look at gas, you look at um, nuclear, wind, um, I think that we have hydro, we have we have opportunities to to use technology that we've created over the last couple of years so that the way we build these new infrastructures are in a very efficient and economical way. Yeah, and I think that comes back to the because they would obviously want to give Bitcoin a bad rap earlier on. So they talked yeah. about the sustainability aspect of Bitcoin. And considering the majority of Bitcoin was getting mined out in China next to coal plants. But you don't say, oh, my Nike trainers or my uh, Adidas sneakers, they're produced by coal. 91% of everything that we buy from China is produced by coal. It's coal production that creates every product you've got. But we don't sit and suddenly start looking at that. We just picked at Bitcoin mining because suddenly it was the cheapest place to do the mining because the electricity was cheapest. Mm -hmm. That was why so much mining was getting on there. So people don't suddenly think of all their product they buy from China. If it says made in China, they might as well just say made by coal power. But right. we don't want to do that. And especially the big brands don't want to do that because they want to be seen as green and sustainable. And then they ship them on big shipping containers all the way back. But no, Bitcoin's the one that gets the bad rap from doing that. I think what's interesting from an oil and gas perspective is that, uh, especially in America and the, you know, the Middle East, they do a lot of flaring of gas. So as they produce the oil, you'll see the burning, it's like a big Bunsen burner burning off there. And they're just flaring off gas there as well. But you can actually capture that gas and you can stick them into mining units. And actually uh, producing it next to sort of oil production where there's flaring of gas or where there's old coal mines where there's methane gas, essentially you would get the land for free and you could actually get access to this flaring of gas as well, which would essentially generate free electricity. The only thing you've got to trust is that you're setting up your mining unit somewhere that's going to be secure in the middle of nowhere. But, right. you know, it, it, it opens that sort of opportunity to it as well. And I think... That's quite interesting from that perspective. So, so moving on now, let, let's talk a little bit about the Bitcoin Energy Summit. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll add it to the the preview just now. So this is the the website itself, BitcoinEnergySummit.com. Um, I'll show the video at the end so everyone can actually uh, bring it in and have a little look from that. So, so this is more about it. But can you give a bit of background towards this? Yeah, sure. So. Um... 
to your point a little bit earlier, you know, China super cheap on electricity. Um, they will, you know, a lot of the past events that I've done, I, I did have a lot of Asian individuals come and, and attend and they tried to sell electricity and it was, I'd say the cheapest electricity I've ever seen, right? Florida's at three and a half cents. They were at a fraction of a penny, right? Um, I think that the, the growth and, and limitations from their government has, has impacted the, their growth uh, or, or expansion of, of mining in general. Um, with that said, with all those ne negative monikers around using coal to, to mine cryptocurrency and the uh, huge data centers that I've seen in China, I've seen images of you know, four or five floors of buildings just mining cryptocurrency. It's, it's a little ridiculous. Um, I feel that from a, I guess, block, Bitcoin network perspective, um, we've been agile enough to, to pivot from using um, negative electricity sources and start using clean energy sources. Um, I think we're at like the last number I saw was over 50, 60 percent that that, you know, Bitcoin is being mined using some sort of clean energy. Um, with that said, for in individuals that are trying to leverage clean energy, there's not really a, a sector or a place where you can come in and meet the players that are offering that type of energy from a uh, blockchain perspective, right? You've got the, the large oil and gas companies, right? But we're looking for uh, a different type of perspective. Sorry for the background noise. Um, so essentially what we want to do with the Energy Summit is we want to connect individuals that are trying to mine or are mining and educate them on what they can or could be doing from a future perspective. So um, how to collect more funds, how to get in front of uh, VCs to, to, you know, um, expand, um, how to use carbon credits, right? Carbon credits are a huge game when it comes to cryptocurrency. And for the viewers, um, it's essentially a discount that's given based on um, usage is a way to look at it. And we can deep dive on that a little bit more as well. Uh, the other thing, and I think the viewers are going to find this very interesting, is when you look at uh, gas, for example, flare gas as a source of energy. Um, a lot of flare gas sites are not as developed as some would expect in the United States. So what happens? You have a mining company that goes to an area that has flare gas. Flare gas is hard to transport from one area to the other. So you've got to use it based on where it is, right? So you've got to build around it. And what's happening is these companies are building out infrastructures in smaller cities that folks don't travel to. There's no road. Um, there's limited jobs. People don't really travel to these remote areas as much. And because of cryptocurrency mining, you've got certain cities that are now expanding and growing because folks are building mining sites there. And because of uh, the fact that they're willing to build those mining sites, those cities and counties are providing discounts or tax credits for doing so. Now, a lot of individuals aren't aware of that from a mining perspective, right? Uh, tax credits are always welcome. And, you know, that's what we want to bring to light. We want to bring th through the summit. We want to bring individuals that are going to educate other companies and teach them, right? How can you have um, uh, decreased taxes, uh, better um pretty much better everything, right? So we want to be able to uh, educate folks on how to raise more funds, how to decrease their taxes, how to provide more for different governments, right? Working with government officials. So we've got a, a nice mix of all three of those topics that I mentioned from a, a government's perspective, ESG perspective, carbon credit perspective, as well as um, investment perspective. So that's a little bit about the summit. Uh, kind of feel like I spoke a lot there, but more than happy to answer any more questions around it. Yeah, that, you know, that's interesting. I think when people think about sustainability and uh, energy production, especially like somewhere like America, where it's like the, the CO2 emissions have dropped rapidly over the, the last, say, 25 years. And it's the same mm -hmm. in the UK where I'm from. And, you know, it's primarily because we've switched away from coal power to natural gas. 
So we're retrofitting the coal mine, the coal um, production units, and we're making them natural gas. Natural gas in Germany is going to be seen as sort of CO2 friendly. So they're going to be able to start counting this towards sustainability. So we, we sit and give this doom and gloom and climate change. But, you know, ultimately, there's parts of the world where they're opening coal plants. And the thing is, in China and India, when they're opening coal plants, they're opening more coal plants than the rest of the world's closing down. But they're the world's factory. So we need to get the goods from somewhere. So I never, ever blame China and India for doing this type thing because, you know, we go into Amazon and we sit and complain if our product's not there in two days, three days, etc. Mm -hmm. But where's it come from? And it's, so it's not their fault. If they're the world's factory, if we want to complain about stuff, we should manufacture it here with renewable energy. I think what's interesting, what you were saying there, and that's part of the problem with renewable energy is it's the transportation of the renewable energy. It's, you know, it's very, very difficult to, and it's very expensive process to turn wind energy and solar energy into hydrogen and then transport it from there. So therefore, you've really got to go to the source. And, you know, you're talking about flaring of gas, but to a certain extent, we're just, if people understand that, you're, you're producing the oil, there's additional gas that's coming there. And when we're flaring it, you're just basically lighting this gas to flare it off. And it's just essentially getting evaporated from the atmosphere. So th what's amazing about the mining units out there is they can actually capture that gas. So A, you're not actually emitting this uh, there, but then they're using it to come and power the mining units as well. I think, um, and especially when they've got another thing, the oil wells, which is interesting and all these, Tim, they're all connected to the grid. So you need grid uh, um, connectivity. So even though you're middle of nowhere, Essentially, you're going to go into these areas. And then what you've found is, because I, I, you know, I know a couple of guys who've been doing this now that they've found that where they're doing low oil production, the way it's like half a barrel, a barrel a day type thing, coming from these small units, uh, <clears throat> the pump jacks, they're actually making as much money from the Bitcoin mining as they are from the actual producing of the oil because it creates a second revenue source to right. the operators. And so you're actually opening that up. And then really, if people start to think about it is, well, what else can that do? They've, they're connected to the grid. So if you start putting renewable energy infrastructure on there as well, you can start feeding that into the grid as well. The problem in that we've got in America, and it's the same with most countries, is, you know, we all live in the same place. You know, you live in Miami, a few million people. I live in San Diego, a couple of million people, LA, et cetera. It's like, how do we create the energy for this? But how do you see the technology from Bitcoining mining going into sustainability and energy as well? Because I think it's starting to move into that sphere. Yeah, I mean, I think what's going to happen is that over time, the amount of miners are going to get, it's going to dwindle down. Um, the individual players is just going to continue to dwindle down. Uh, I feel like the folks that were early adopters in the cryptocurrency mining, um, either they made it or they didn't make it, right? And for the few that did make it, they some I'd say about 30, 40% of them did it in a way where they would be able to pivot into something else if they needed to. So, um, in the United States, uh, around 2017, 2018, uh, marijuana was starting to be legalized. A lot of individuals were trying to get ready to, to cultivate and grow marijuana in the, across the United States or in different states. And what I found was that companies were investing into locations that um, they can eventually do that. But since they weren't legally able to cultivate and then grow it, what they did was they turned them into mining farms, right? So I've got a location that's um, exhausting heat out of an area, right? And I'm going to go ahead and put these machines in there. I don't have to have too many folks there to, to take care of it. A couple security guards if I'm in a building. And once I legally have the ability to transition this into something else, I just take the machines out, I sell them, and I'm ready to go before other industries, right? So I, I think... I think a lot of the players are going to continue to dwindle down. Now, from a sustainability perspective, I think, eh, man, it's it's tough to answer that question, to be honest. But I think, I think we're going to learn over time. I, I don't think that there's a clear-cut answer on how the future of Bitcoin mining is going to look in a couple of years. But I think we're going to learn by trial and error. Um, we're going to start by 
you know, mining in our home using GP, using uh, GPUs and computers. And then as the algorithm becomes harder to solve and I can't use a basic computer to continue mining, we're going to start using ASICs. And as we start, um, as more halvings occur, it's going to be harder to mine using an ASIC. And we're going to put, you know, five, 10, 20, a thousand of them together. And we're going to start using an energy source um, that we think is clean or sustainable or the right way to do it. And people are going to complain. We're going to learn from our mistakes and we're going to continue to pivot. I think the the n blockchain network or the Bitcoin network is as agile as it could be for its size. And I think that's going to lend itself to um, pivoting in the right direction as we continue to move forward. But to be perfectly honest, the only thing that I can tell you right now is we, we've got to try to use um, as clean as energy as possible. We've got to continue to develop uh, economies or areas that are underdeveloped wherever we can and continue to add value uh, across the globe ho however possible. Yeah, no, no, that's a good answer. Yeah, it, it's always a difficult one when you're coming, <clears throat> trying to discuss the future sustainability as well. Right. Um, if, if you're thinking back to the Bitcoin Energy Summit as well, so you've got, you spoke about, you've got a congressman. I'm just looking there, Byron Donalds, so yeah. U.S. congressman. So uh, let us, the, the viewers, know a little bit about what he's going to be doing at the, the summit and what he'll be talking about. Yeah, so... There is, from a Bitcoin perspective, right, financial sector, there's always been a barrier of entry from a government perspective, right? And as the time goes by, we're seeing those layers peel off. The individuals that are saying um, Bitcoin is going to go to zero, Bitcoin's trash, you know, it's not an investable, um, you know, product, Um over years, we found that those negative promoters to become net positive promoters, right? A, a lot of those individuals are now saying that Bitcoin and is the future, right? Um, what we've done in at Energy Summit is we've tried to bring in individuals, and Brian, uh, Byron is one of them, that can come and speak to what the government perspective of Bitcoin is now and in the future. So what things are the government uh, currently doing? what are they willing to potentially to start doing in the future right and um where they see uh bitcoin mining uh in the next six years six months you know so on and so forth so i i think it's it's always interesting to see what's coming or what's going to be expected from a government perspective there are grants that are out there that that we can leverage to to grow certain mining companies and and we've had it this is the second year of Energy Summit. Last year, we had a very interesting panel where folks were really talking about how you can apply for grants and, and potentially grow your business that way. So I think, um, and, and I think that's that's a little bit of what multiple speakers are going to be bringing, not only uh, Byron, to, to our event. Yeah, and so when is the last Bitcoin going to be mined? Oh, great question. Um, so individuals might tell you it'll happen around 2050, 2017. But the fact of the matter is nobody's really going to know. Um, the halving is scheduled to actually occur as of, uh, I think, yesterday on the day of Energy Summit on the 23rd. But if, if we're adding more miners and individuals are growing their mining sites, we're going to be mining cr the Bitcoin quicker and therefore the date in which we uh, mine that specific number of Bitcoin is going to continue to diminish and decrease. So, you know, the actual date is more than likely going to depend based on the hash rate over time. If our hash rate or, or the amount of, you know, Bitcoin that's being mined continues to increase, I think that that timing is going to change. So uh, another difficult question. Love it. Um, so if I had to give it a number, I think the last number I saw was around 2045, 2050. Um, something along those lines. Okay, well, we'll get you back in the show in 2050 if we're still around. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, look, you were spot on with this date coming back. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, when the halving comes in and becomes more expensive, is this going to take away the sort of people be able to Bitcoin mine at home now? Uh, yeah, well, 
right now there's a lot of opportunities to be able to mine Bitcoin at home. There's a lot of, there's quite a few companies that have come out and said, you know, there are Bitcoin fans and there are people that are proponents of Bitcoin without the need of trying to earn money. So what I've seen is individuals come up with boxes that look like the old CPU towers that you can put in the corner of your house. It's somewhat quiet and you can mine Bitcoin with it or some sort of cryptocurrency with it. Now, if I plug it into my home in Florida and try and mine it based on my electricity cost, I'm going to be paying more than what I'm earning right right now. Um, it, it's not as sustainable as some folks would imagine, right? The ability to mine at home is going to be really dependent on your your rate, your, 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 your cost of electricity. Um, so based on that, I would say it's not as recommended to mine on Bitcoin, uh, to mine Bitcoin now uh, from, from your home, depending on the size of your home, right? Um, I've, I have seen some companies that have actually come up with boxes that you can put outside, think of a storage box, put it outside. You can uh, uh, put, you know, five, six, A6 in there and you can also mine. Again, based on the current rate, I don't think it's profitable to mine in most states. Now, with the having approaching and we're talking about Bitcoin potentially hitting over $100,000, um, let, let's do some of that math, right? So if Bitcoin's at, what was it, a couple months, six months ago was hovering around 30K, um, about a year ago, six months to a year ago was hovering around 30K. And those mining companies, let's say, you know, they're, they're mining their cryptocurrency. Now we get to the halving and they're, their output's going to be cut in half, right? So I was earning one Bitcoin a month, 30,000 a month. Now I'm going to earn half a Bitcoin a month. Well, that kind of sucks. But the price went from 30 to 100, right? So even if I'm earning half, I'm now generating 50K, right? Half of that 100. So I think depending on where that price point gets to, there is an opportunity to start mining at home. But Kind of like most of the crazes, you've got to, you're going to have, from an investment perspective or from a mining perspective, you're going to have to make that decision sooner rather than later. You're going to have to say, I think this is the future and I think it's going to continue to go up. So I'm going to make some of these purchases now before it's too late. And the reason I say that is uh, mining G using GPUs and mining using ASICs, what happens? Everyone sees that it's profitable. Everybody wants to do it. Therefore, if you try and buy a GPU and it's profitable to mine using GPUs, you're probably not going to be able to mine, find any. And if you look at companies like AMD and NVIDIA, they have essentially boomed because from 2017 to, I'd say, to when Ethereum changed to proof of stake, a lot of individuals were mining with GPUs. And I was personally one of them, right? You've got a couple thousand GPUs mining. You're hopefully earning maybe half an Ethereum a month, an Ethereum a month, depending on, you know, when you started. And you just, over time, continue to add more machines. Now, if if individuals want to mine at home, right, you're going to have to buy the equipment to be able to do it. But if it's profitable, everybody's going to buy it. Therefore, you're not going to be able to buy any supply, right? Um, if you look at um, the larger ASIC manufacturers, ASICs are, um, machines that are used to mine Bitcoin now um, or solve computational uh, algorithms. Um, they come out with a minimum, with, with a certain amount per year and they almost always get sold out, right? So a lot of individuals end up having to buy uh, through the secondary market at 10X or 3X or 5X. It's really going to depend on the price. Right now we can sell uh, an ASIC that's five years old, probably for a low amount of money. But if Bitcoin hits a million dollars and that machine can turn a profit, it's going to sell for a profit as well. So um, I think for the individual that wants to mine at home, you need to make that decision sooner rather than later based on how you feel the, the price of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency is going to move. Keeping in mind that your electricity cost is not going to change. None of that is going to adjust. Well, hopefully, 
right? <laughs> um, but I think the combination of um, where the price goes and the ability to purchase the machines to be able to mine the currency is what's going to determine if you can or can't mine at home. It's, it's going to be interesting what happens after the halving, you know? So it'll be, I think this one with everything that's happened with the Bitcoin ETFs and institutional money coming into Bitcoin, because a lot of the people just selling Bitcoin now are miners trying to right. raise capital. Can you explain a little bit why the miners are selling their Bitcoin right now? Sure. So there's a combination of reasons, right? Uh, miners find themselves have needing to sell uh, Bitcoin for, for quite a few things. So in some instances, it really depends on the miner. But in some instances, um, you know, let's talk about it. We've got a company that is mining a product and has overhead. Right. So if they want to be able to cover that overhead, what do they do? They have to sell what they're mining so that they can cover their overhead. Um, my thought is those companies are, are mining are selling what they need to cover their costs. But my hope is they're, they're also hodling to an extent. Now, with that said, there has been a large amount of mining companies selling their Bitcoin. Why? Because they've held it over a period of time. Um, they could have earned it at around 20, 30 K. Um, in some instances, a lot of those companies did not want to sell at 30K, right? Because they felt that Bitcoin was going to go up. They started building their sites when Bitcoin was at 50, 60K. It dropped down to 30. And what do they do? They, they may have gotten a loan, some sort of bridge loan to cover their costs until Bitcoin got to a certain point where they can sell and cover some of those loans. So now a lot of those mining companies, uh, now that Bitcoin's hitting around what, 52K, 52 and a half. Um, they're saying it's a good time for me to sell, cover some of those costs that I've incurred, as well as potentially expand and grow my operation. Um, what I've found, uh, I, I, I did for a couple of years sell or, or help connect dots in the mining space. So uh, different land sites, different locations, wind farms, uh, mentioned earlier flare gas. You know, how can uh, there's always companies that are trying to do this at a smaller scale. Right. And then expand into something else. What I found is that a lot of the folks looking for those types of deals has decreased because they're not they're, they're kind of those companies were hunkering down and thinking, hey, I'm at 30 K Bitcoin. I, I I'm barely breaking even. I've got investors. I should be turning a profit, but I'm not. And the plug could get pulled at any point in time. Right. So now that. Um, Bitcoin's doubled since then, since almost. Um, I think that's kind of driven folks to sell some of the Bitcoin, hopefully not all of it, and put themselves in a position to make investors happy, grow their existing farms, and continue to develop their mining company. Yeah, it, it's just fascinating what's happening. And then it's just this mainstream adoption where everyone's now starting to get interested in it as well. And as institutional money comes into Bitcoin, it's just exactly what you said earlier, Fernando, is, you know, they're buying into it not to sell. Yeah, I, I thought it was very interesting that, you know, I, I'm sure we read a lot of blockchain cryptocurrency articles. I found it interesting to your point earlier that a couple of months ago, a large amount of mining, co mining companies started dumping their cryptocurrency. Um, I do think that it was based on the news of the ETFs. If you notice, the ETF was announced and, you know, ETH kind of Ethereum went up because they started pricing in the potential of an Ethereum ETF. But then Bitcoin, as most instances, started to go down a little bit. And I think some of those companies panicked because if you think about it, if they know that the halving is coming and the amount of Bitcoin coming in is going to get dropped in half and, and supply and demand is going to pour force that price up, why wouldn't they hold another, I don't know, three or four months when they've already been holding for a year? So I, I do think that they made a business decision. I don't feel that it was the best business decision, right? Um, considering they probably were holding that Bitcoin for a couple of years and they could have just held it for three more months to kind of see what happens with the halving. But, you know, they could have just been protecting their investments because if the opposite occurs, and Bitcoin does not go from 30K to 50, 50K or something along those lines. The ETF doesn't get approved, whatever the case may be. 
that Bitcoin goes to 10, they, those companies are under, they're down. You know, a lot, a lot of individuals are, are getting loans on their Bitcoin, so they don't have to sell it. But if they get a mar if, if the price drops and they get a margin call on their Bitcoin, their company is going to go under. Right. So, you know, unfortunately, it was it was a business decision for some of them. Um, I think it's 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 going to be interesting what happens over the next couple months. I think a lot of those companies right now are focused on accumulating and saying, OK, I, I, I dumped on this trough right now with, with the ETF. I, I sold my Bitcoin. I'm going to accumulate for another couple months. And depending on what happens, we're either going to sell a little bit more or, or just keep on hodling. <clears throat> yeah, that's the, that's the, the, the secret for everyone out there is to hodl. And I think that's one of the other reasons why the governments were sort of against this is because of hodling. Because if you're at home and you can't afford to buy a property or you can't afford to buy a house, you can't afford to buy any assets because it's very difficult barri barriers to entry. And suddenly this digital asset comes along. You know, traditionally, you're not going to go out and buy gold because a bar of gold is quite expensive and you're sort of scared to go into that market space. You know, who buys a bar of gold and hides it under their bed? So you don't think of it like that. And then suddenly this digital asset comes out, this digital gold. And to me, it's better than gold because what's gold for? You know, it's just a shiny rock that we we put value in. We don't use it for anything. We're not using it for telecoms. We're not using it for fiber optics. It's not a, a metal that we use for multiple different things. It's just a store of value. And suddenly this digital store of value came along that allowed people to have fractional ownership of this gold or digital gold. And suddenly they're buying into an asset. Now, if you suddenly had millions of people buying into an asset, this is money traditionally, they'd go stick back in the economy because people did that. Most people who rent are living month to month. You get your wages in, you, you pay your bills, you've got a little bit extra, you'll either go on vacation or you'll go out and spend it, you know, to restaurants, bars, fun, where they are. as you get older, you put it into your kids there as well. Now people are taking, oh, I'm going to take $200 this month and stick it into Bitcoin. I'll do this month after month after month after month. And the price goes up and down and people are buying into this asset class, but they're no longer sticking it directly into the economy. And I think that is a fear for a lot of governments as well, because suddenly the man, woman in the street, that person in the street, they are now starting to think differently in terms of their investments and where their investments can be. And I think that's what's amazing to me about something like Bitcoin and all these digital assets is it's opening up to millions and millions of people in the world, if not billions of people who've never owned assets to actually start owning a digital asset. And that's what's so exciting. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, man, I have a lot of opinions and a lot of things came through my mind when you were talking about that specifically. Um, I, so if, if you think of, of gold in general um, and back to supply and demand, I feel like that's been my hot word the entire uh, 40, 50 minutes that we've been on this interview, right? Supply and demand. Um, within the last six months, they found a, uh, uh, a site in Africa that had uh, what I what I read was the equivalent of the existing gold supply in the entire economy. They found the largest amount of lost gold treasure off the coast of Colombia a couple months ago as well. Um, gold itself, it, it although folks like to wear it and it's a show of status, um, it, the supply of it seemed to continue to increase. Uh, and and you mentioned gold. I also mentioned diamonds. Diamonds, we, we've now got lab-grown diamonds that look just like the real ones. So, like, why would I buy one versus the other? There's just so – over time, folks have found a way of, you know, finding more gold or decreasing the price of things that people really love, right? That's that's the way I'm looking at it. Now, Bitcoin is, is solely based on the ability uh, – on what somebody is willing to pay for it. Is it at 52K now on an exchange? Yes. If I'm walking down the street and I have nothing in my pocket and I'm dying of hunger, am I willing to trade it for a dollar or willing to trade it for a meal, box of pizza? Maybe. It might be worth less to others. It might be worth more to others. But the cool thing about it is it's based on what somebody's willing to pay, not always on the supply because the supply is increasing at a, at a fixed rate, right? Um, so I, I feel that it's 
it's it's a really cool asset to hold. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention that I was thinking about as you were speaking was um, hodling in general, right? Uh, a lot of individuals feel that from a crypto perspective, day trading is where it's at. And it is um, if you want to make or potentially make money on swings. But what ends up happening to a lot of individuals that I speak to is I may, you know, they make millions of dollars on Bitcoin day trading it, right? Just taking those two to 3% swings. But what happens is when you have a major swing, they don't end up getting the play in that space. Because what happens is Bitcoin goes down 2%, they're going to buy it. It goes up 2%, they're going to sell it. They're netting that 4 or 5% every couple days, if that, once a week, depending on the weekly cycles. Um, but what happens if it doesn't go back down that 2% and it just keeps going up and up and up? they lose the opportunity for that. So a lot of individuals that, that I've met, um, the ones that have really made the most money are the ones that, you know, bought at six cents, 10 cents, and forgot they even had it. You know, um, somebody told me to invest $100 in this, put it in my computer, haven't touched it. And then you hear those crazy stories of the individuals that did the exact same thing, but threw the computer away, and they're trying to do everything they can to find it. So um, I think over time, um, it's going to be interesting to see what ends up happening uh, for the amount of uh, Bitcoin that individuals hold based on its price. Because what's happening is a lot of folks have a perception that I need to have at least one Bitcoin, right? I, I need to have at least one. Um, it was 20, 30, 50K. I need to have one. But once it gets to 100,000, 200,000, a million dollars, I think that that story is going to change a little bit. Folks are going to be like, oh, you just need to have, you know, a tenth of a Bitcoin or a fraction of a Bitcoin. Like, I, I think that's going to continue to evolve over time. Um, something else that you mentioned, it was at the tip of my tongue just now. Um, ah, just lost it. Ah, sorry, just lost it. But, you know, um, I do feel that over the last couple of years, um, I had mentioned I came into the game around 16, 17. There was not really uh, the government ta making sure what's happening from a trades perspective. The government was against Bitcoin from the beginning until they found a way to monetize it for themselves. And as they continue to be able to monetize it for themselves through taxes, through ETFs and fees, things like that, and just being able to consume individuals' wealth in a way, in, in a specific way. Um, I, I think Bitcoin, it, it's official. To me, it's official with the ETFs and everything and, and, and the tax implications around it. It's not going anywhere at this point. Like if the government is now creating all these um, uh, legalities around it, like there's, there's nothing that, there's no incentive for the government to take it away. And as they continue to earn more money from Bitcoin. So I have a Bitcoin. It's worth 30K. It's now worth a million, right? Let's say in a couple of years, hopefully. Um, and I and I go to sell one. Government's going to tax me a percentage of that mill. They're going to earn some money. So over time, as Bitcoin goes up, we're going to make more money. And because of taxes... They're going to make more money. And I don't think that's going to change. I think if, if you look at it historically, the U.S. government is what? Top three, top four holders of Bitcoin, period. Like it, it's, it's not it's not by chance. Right. So, you know, all those are signs that are pointing me towards wanting to hold longer. Right. Um, I've got some Bitcoin that's been dormant for a long time. Right. Uh, I think. There's some that I haven't moved since, I don't know, sub $200. And it's going to stay like that because the signs that I'm seeing are pointing towards um, even more mainstream adoption. And I hope that answered your question. I know I was kind of all over the place there. <laughs> no, no, that, that, that's perfect. That's perfect. And now Larry Fink's now the, the biggest proponent of Bitcoin. He didn't like it when he didn't run it, but now his ETF's up running from BlackRock and 
you know, if people understand who Larry Fink is there, you know, you can't invest in the stock market without Larry Fink owning the company, oh. basically, or the, the biggest share of every company out there. So now he's got the Bitcoin ETF, everybody, you know. Yeah. The question sometimes is, who is the president of America? Is it Larry Fink <laughs> or is it like uh, Biden or Trump? You know, we'll, we'll wait and see. But, uh, you know, uh, Google that guy, everybody who doesn't know who he is, and then realize that if he's backing Bitcoin, then you've got or the big institutional guys backing Bitcoin. So it's definitely here to stay. So just to, just to finish off the podcast, because I could keep asking you questions about this all day. And uh, the great thing for the viewers is I'm going to be speaking at the Bitcoin Energy Summit. So I'm excited to, to meet you in person. But just to, to sum up then, uh, Fernando, if you just go a little bit about uh, how they can find more information about it. Yeah. So if you're interested in finding more information about the Energy Summit, Feel free to go to our website at BitcoinEnergySummit.com. Um, from there, you'll be able to see our speakers, where the event's going to be hosted, and you'll be able to buy, purchase tickets directly. You can also find us on all forms of social media, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and uh, yeah, and YouTube. <laughs> Okay, perfect. So, and then what I'll do is I'll put the little video in the outro of the, the, the podcast as well. So, well, thanks very much for your time today. I appreciate your busy guy, Fernando. Thank you, Alistair. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for being here, and I hope you have a great weekend. Okay, thanks to everyone out there. You've been watching Boom, It's on the Blockchain. My name's Alistair Caithness. Have a nice day.